The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. TVO is proud to mark five decades as Ontario's public broadcaster. As part of the celebrations, we're looking back and updating some of our favorite items from past summers. Last year, we spoke to journalist and author Anne Huey about her book, Chop Suey Nation. Since then, it's won a Gourmand World Cookbook Award and was shortlisted for an International Association of Culinary Professionals 2020 Cookbook Award. I'm Nam Kiwanuka, and tonight, on the agenda in the summer, a conversation with Anne Huey. And we have an update on vertical farming in the north from our Ontario hubs. It might surprise you to learn that even the smallest cities and towns in this giant country of ours have one culinary thing in common, a Chinese restaurant. Anne Huey is a national food reporter for the Global Mail, and she journeyed from Victoria to Fogo Island, stopping at many of them. Along the way, she captured it all in her new book, Chop Suey Nation, The Legion Cafe, and other stories from Canada's Chinese restaurants. And Anne Huey joins us now. Hi. Hi. Um, so when you came back from that trip, how long did you wait before you had Chinese food again? <laughs> I actually wasn't as tired of the food as you might imagine. Mm. Um, towards the end of the trip, we started getting pretty strategic about not ordering too much food. and. Um, most of the, my standard order towards the end of the, the trip was pretty much just a spring roll and an egg roll to go. Yeah. Um, so it actually wasn't that, that much longer. I think probably within a couple of weeks, we were probably You were done, yeah. And the, the we order. is you and your husband. You traveled across the country. Um, and this book grew out of an essay that you first wrote for the Global Mail. Um, and you were writing about the presence of Chinese restaurants across Canada. Why was this of interest to you? I grew up in Vancouver. Um, where I had access to some amazing Chinese food, uh, huge variety, huge diversity of Chinese food. Um, and we were really just kind of obsessed with, you know, the, the, the newest roast pork place or where we could get the freshest seafood or the best dim sum. There was just so much Chinese food available. But every time we left Vancouver, every time we left these cities, we would, I would encounter these Chinese restaurants that were so different from what I was used to, uh, primarily in small towns. They, for the most part, all seemed to have the same names, the same decor, and these menus that were filled with all of these dishes that I, for the most part, didn't even recognize. So these were dishes like chop suey, uh, sweet and sour chicken balls, lemon chicken, ginger beef, dishes that I had never eaten before, let alone heard of. Um, and, and so over time, I just became obsessed with, with wanting to know more about these restaurants. Why are there so many of them? Why are they so uniform? Where does this food come from? Um, and eventually, in, in 2016, I, I pitched the idea of a road trip to my Globe editors. They said yes. Uh, and we set out to, to find answers to all these questions. You wrote about an incident when you were in school mm -hmm. and they had this day to celebrate Chinese uh, uh, culture and food. And then when you had the food, you were like, this is not the food I that I have. I was like, what is this? Whose yeah. Chinese food is this? Um, so, uh, you know, I recognized that a lot of these dishes were very delicious. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I would hear everybody around me namely my family, relatives, often restaurant workers in these authentic Chinese restaurants, kind of dismiss this cuisine. Uh, they, they view chop suey Chinese as being kind of lesser than, as fake Chinese. Uh, it, it was very common to denigrate this kind of food. And so I liked it and recognized it as being delicious, but at the same time, I definitely internalized a lot of the, these messages of it being, you know, something less than what I was used to. On this road trip, uh, you find out some secrets. We're not going to talk about all of them, obviously. Uh, but something that came up that you didn't seem to really be to know was that your own family had a history in um, having a restaurant. Mm -hmm. How did you discover that? It was actually it was actually after the road trip, um, some months after we had completed this, you know, 9,000 kilometer trip, 18 days living out of a suitcase, um, driving from coast to coast, meeting all of these families, learning their stories, stories published in the Globe. 
uh, I think three or four months later, I'm in Vancouver visiting my parents, and I, ha I was having this conversation with my dad, and all of a sudden, you know, he revealed to me, essentially, that he had run a Chinese restaurant with my mom in the years before I was born in this small town outside of Vancouver. And learning that was, well, surprising, first of all. I mean, I just felt dumb because I had just finished this trip and hadn't thought to even ask uh, my own family about their own story. Uh, but also it just, it made it clear to me how little I knew of my own family's story. And that led me on this almost second journey to want to wanna learn more about where we came from and how we somehow wound up here. You know, there are definitely elements within uh, Chinese culture that, that don't necessarily condone sharing uh, less than pleasant stories or, or kind of airing dirty laundry. So I think there are a lot of different elements. Um, but what learning my own family story taught me is that it's so important to, to f not fight that, but to, to really insist on learning these stories because, you know, we are at risk of, of losing them. And I think that these stories are the ones that are just so essential to understand and to know about, you know, who we are as Canadians and where we all come from. Earlier in the book, you refer to Chinatowns um, as having started out as bachelor societies. Why was that? So, the first Chinese people who arrived in Canada uh, came here for uh, one of two reasons, essentially. It was either to participate in the gold rush um, or in the railway industry. Um, after these two um, industries kind of uh, ended or, or, or wound down. Um, some of these Chinese men started venturing out and, and seeking employment elsewhere. Um, because of that, many local Canadians, many white Canadians uh, felt threatened by that. They felt that their jobs were uh, perhaps at risk um, and they viewed these, these Chinese men very much as a threat. Um, so around that time, so in the late uh, 19th century, early 20th century, there were a number of different policies that were put in place, uh, essentially restricting the number of Chinese people um, who were allowed into this country. So at first it was a head tax. So that went from being a $50 charge for any Chinese man or woman uh, to come to this country. Um, and that was eventually raised to $500. And because again, I mean, this was a prohibitive figure at the time. It just didn't make sense to bring women over. The whole point of bringing Chinese men over was for earning potential. And so because of that, we saw pretty much only men, Chinese men in Canada for a very long time. Um, and, and these Chinatowns became kind of havens for these Chinese men, you know. On one hand, they were constantly under threat from um, either rioting from, again, these, these locals who did not see these Chinese men as, as a welcome presence. Uh, they were often being uh, targeted by local police, again, based on these same kind of fears um, about these, these, these Chinese men. Um, so part of it was safety, wanting to, to stay within, you know, confined areas and, and sticking together, safety in numbers. Um, but part of it was also just because it was, it, only, it was the only way, way of, they could stay, right? Yes, and, and also just being social. You know, it, it, was, it was being around other people who had been through a similar experience, who spoke similar languages. So, as you said, these became these communities that were pretty much only men uh, for the longest time. And Chinese restaurants were in these communities, um, but eventually they played a role in uh, bringing uh, people over from China. How did that happen? So what you started seeing as these restaurants became more established was, you know, maybe the original owner of that restaurant or workers in that restaurant had family back in China that they wanted to bring over, you know, who, who also had families that they would want to send money back to and, and support in the same way. And so you started seeing a lot of that kind of generations uh, would would bring over the next generation of, of young men. Um, they would train these young men. Uh, they would employ these young men. And then eventually these young men would be ready to start their own Chinese restaurants. And so you started to see these restaurants spread kind of, you know, maybe from a town that's 40 minutes outside of Vancouver. Um, 
their nephew or their son or their grandchild would open a restaurant in the town next to that, mm -hmm. and then their next generation would open up a Chinese restaurant in the town next to that, and then you would see these restaurants kind of spread out of all of these towns and cities across the country. Um, when you look at how your dad came to be here, how your grandfather came to be here, and then you think about the opportunities that you have and your sisters have, um, how, what what goes through your mind to realize that all of this started the way it started? And this is stuff that you've learned by writing this book. I think it's, I mean, it's pretty astounding that within the span of two generations, you can see so many changes in terms of, you know, where, where my grandfather was starting from and, and the, the extremely privileged uh, lives that, that my sisters and I have. You know, we grew up in this country. We grew up speaking English. We were given the opportunity to have, you know, multiple advanced degrees. I have this great job where I get to write for a living. It's, it, it just speaks to the, these amazing opportunities that we just, I feel like I just kind of lucked into because I happened to be born here. Um, it's that whole idea of you know the Canadian dream, the American dream, the Canadian dream. It's it. it I am a living example of that. Has uncovering um, your own family history shifted your feelings of how you maybe feel about Canada? You know, for a lot of a lot of children of especially recent immigrants, um, our our pasts and our histories are uh, often. We have gaps missing. We don't quite know all of the answers behind where we come from. You know, I had a lot of classmates growing up where, when we were assigned uh, to, to, to put together our family tree, they came together with like perfect documents and they had all the names and all the faces and all the dates. Uh, they had all of that. And it wasn't until I wrote this book and learned that history and was finally able to fill in all of those those blanks and, and those gaps, did I understand that, that, that sense of, some people call it pedigree, I, I think maybe identity or, or that sense of belonging that comes with understanding your own story. Um, and then beyond that, to understand how our story fits within the larger Canadian story has definitely shifted my thinking. In what ways? Well, not only in understanding that our story has value and deserves to be told, but also in understanding that our story actually tells a very essential part of Canada's history. And do you think it may be you, because in the book at the beginning you write about what it was like to be the other, um, does it make you maybe stand a bit taller and more uh, proud in your own history? I think that's a very nice way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> and Huey, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. The book me. is fantastic. Thank you. And congratulations. Thank you. We're standing in a 400 square foot modular farm. Uh, we use uh, hydroponic vertical growing technology to grow year round. Um, our farm is uh, basically an oversized walking cooler that's set on a steel frame. Uh, 10 feet high, 10 feet wide by 40 feet long and it lets us grow uh, a little under 4,000 plants. Stéphane Longtemps operates Smart Green Sudbury and he's taking a different approach to farming in Northern Ontario. He's growing vertically. We had a terrible farming season this summer. Uh, tons of rain, no sunlight. And so for us, the, the advantage is that I'm growing year round. Uh, it doesn't matter what the weather is like outside. I know that this farm is gonna stay at a, a nice uh, 19 to 20 degrees Celsius. In Northern Ontario, that's huge. Uh, with only about 100 days of, of frost-free weather, uh, you're kind of hard-pressed to have uh, a go at it. He and his family have been growing kale and sprouts in Chelmsford, Ontario, about 20 kilometers northwest of Sudbury since April, and it's been a big hit at the local farmer's market. Our kale is uh, unique. Uh, hydroponic kale has a taste uh, unlike outdoor kale. It's got a sweetness to it. And our customers, we didn't really start wanting to just farm kale, but for now, uh, our respond, the response has been so good that we're, we're growing it and we're selling it out every week. Uh, the beauty of the peat moss is that it res retains a lot of water. Eh? All our seeds are non-GMO organic certified seeds. 
they stay in our seedling station, uh, which is kind of, uh, most people would know, a little seedling trays. We start them off as babies for about three weeks. And after they're about two or three inches tall, uh, we'll transfer them to our main irrigation system with the big lights. We'll plant it and it'll stay in the towers for about three or four months. We harvest on a week, week to week uh, cycle. Our lights only emit uh, blue and reds for the most part. Uh, we don't have any green spectrum because plants don't use green spectrum. So hydroponics is all about efficiency, delivering nutrients to the root system more efficiently. So our lights are designed for growing leafy greens and they do that very well. His farm has a few downsides with hydro being the biggest. He runs his lights 18 hours a day and racks up about $800 a month in electricity bills. And the startup costs for a modular farm are north of $100,000. Uh, we're just at the beginning of what I think is going to be an agricultural revolution. There's going to be leaps and bounds and improvements in the technology. I think traditional agriculture is going to be around forever. But you can't ignore that we're quickly depleting all of our good soil. We're quickly going to be depleting all of our fresh water. Even in Canada, that's going to be an issue in the near future. Modular Farms was created in 2015 and the systems were designed for regions like Northern Canada where food security continues to plague communities, but it also applies to Northern Ontario where only a small fraction of food is locally grown. 96% of their food sources was imported. So Sudbury is only producing about 4% of their food locally. Um, Sudbury, uh, if you go and drive around in our agricultural, agricultural land, uh, it's a lot of it is potato. So there is very little fresh greens being grown. Thanks to this modular farm, Stefan and his family can grow about 110 pounds of kale every week. The modular farm uses a fraction of the water a traditional farmer does to grow their crop. He can also manage the temperature, humidity, CO2 levels and watering schedule from this control system. The internet, I control everything on my phone um, and it really allows me to dial in the farm. Stefan and his family already have plans of expanding. They are in talks of getting a second modular farm on their property. My business model is on a week to week cycle. My harvesting schedule is on a week to week cycle. My life is on a week to week cycle. We're happy to report that they haven't just continued to produce all that produce, they're thriving. Here to update us on their operations from Chelmsford, Ontario, Stefan Longtin, farmer and co-owner of Truly Northern. Welcome to the show. Hi, Dan. How are you? Good. Now, the last time uh, we checked in, uh, business looks obviously a little bit different. We were talking, we were talking in a 400 square foot, quote unquote, walking a cooler. Uh, tell me how things have changed since. Um, not too long after, actually, we did that interview with you, um, we got approached by someone who had a uh, large building in a small town about five hours north of Sudbury in Opus Attica. And so for the last year, we've been launching uh, a new type of hydroponic system in there and, and really boosting production. Now, I, uh, we have a photo of that new facility. Uh, let's see, there you are on your ladder. Tell us how different uh, this looks. You look really happy. Uh, tell us uh, how, how much different is this facility to uh, the old one? Well, when we launched uh, in Opus Attica, I had a very specific idea of what I wanted in a farm and how I wanted to be farming. So we did some changes to how we uh, are doing things. We're, we're still growing indoors. We're still doing vertical, but we're doing stacked horizontal. Uh, so multiple layers, um, but more traditionally positioned. And in terms of sheer space, we're talking 400 square feet to, uh, if, I, if I'm right, 23,000. And you haven't even filled it up yet. So the building is huge. Uh, we're not going to be using 23,000 square feet, but that's definitely how big the building is. It's, it's massive. Um, we've got about 8,000 square feet of, of grow space. Um, we're now at 50% and hope to be um, you know, doubling our production within the next six months to a year. Now, when we were chatting, of course, you were focusing exclusively on kale. Um, is that the same strategy here? Have you guys started to experiment with other uh, vegetables and crops? Yeah, well, with that much space on our hands, we definitely are playing a little bit more. Um, we've now introduced lettuce mix very consistently. We've got basil. We're playing with other uh, fresh herbs. 
Um, but Kale brings us back. Uh, our, our new launch that we just did this week, we're doing pretty much exclusively Kale. Uh, the product, just uh, the customer base we have for it loves it. So we're growing, we're expanding, but we're sticking to our roots too. Now, I just want to be clear, you still have your facility in Chelmsford and uh, mm -hmm. you kind of have a busy schedule going back and forth, correct? Oh yeah, that's right. So, so Sudbury is still our home base um, and we still have our two container farms there. And uh, we've launched kind of a self-serve um, uh, shed, basically. Um, and uh, yeah, and I drive, I drive back and forth every week, uh, so it's been pretty busy. Um, what do you think has been sort of the success to your model? You guys have been, you know, thriving, uh, particularly in Northern Ontario, when you think about farming, what do you think are some of the key successes there? Um, I think our product is consistently better than what you can find at the store. It's also well priced when you're considering the freshness and the value or the taste that you're getting. Um, all of our products are pesticide free and our customer base loves that. Um, so you're getting fresh, you're getting delicious, and you're getting it year round. So it's a local, you know, northern grown product, which is great. And you've also had a lot of interest uh, from people over the years about uh, vertical farming, kind of been sort of the spokesperson for uh, northern Ontario. Uh, tell us about kind of the calls that you've been receiving from municipalities and other businesses. Um, we've, uh, we get phone calls every week. Um, at people asking us how we're doing it, what we're doing, and we are now in a process of, of really expanding on that part of our business. Uh, so we're definitely interested in helping people do uh, what we're doing, and, uh, and we're excited. I think there is definitely a new movement and a new um, awakening to local food and the importance of producing our food locally. So I think it's going to become more and more important for us. Any advice for people uh, who are interested in it? I know when we talked, uh, upfront costs was a was a big thing. Um, you had talked about long hours and you know making the six hour drive back and forth. What advice are you giving people? Um, indoor farming, hydroponics, outdoor farming, it's all farming. Uh, so you have to enjoy what you're doing. I think for us, what we the the big benefit is that to see the people and, and to see the the feedback we're getting from our products. So. I think get into it if you really enjoy uh, working with your hands and, and using your head because it is still uh, technically a little bit difficult. But aside from that, um, finding um, a niche and, and kind of finding your community that, that wants local food, I think it's, it's more and more important. One of the things we had talked about, and it's a conversation when we talk about Northern Ontario, is food security. Of course, we're in the midst of a pandemic. Has, has COVID-19 highlighted um, food security in the North and the issues there? Absolutely. I think, I think food security has always been um, in the forefront in Northern Ontario. I think come around January and February, we, we understand food security quite well up here. Uh, now, I think people are, are worried even more uh, because of the situation in the United States and our dependence on importing a lot of our food. Um, so I think a lot of communities are, are waking up to the idea that we do need to, to roll our sleeves and to grow our own food. One of the things uh, in, in the pandemic, um, you know, normally this is the summer, you would be out at the farmer's market. Um, you know, how have you adapted your business to deal with a pandemic? And I want to bring up one of the, uh, some photos of the shed that you had brought up. This was something that you have used well before the pandemic. Tell us what we're looking at. That's a photo from the outside. And, uh, uh, and there's some, some great footage inside as well. The whole idea of being like when we launched, we wanted to have a retail customer base. So, so selling directly from our farm and uh, we started out with a freezer. It was just a little freezer that we had painted green and we had a little space heater in there that would kick on if the weather got too cold or, or the freezer itself would kick on if the weather got too hot. And that grew into now what is a ice shack that we've converted to a self-serve stand. And uh, for us, it's been wonderful. We used to be tied to the farm uh, with people, you know, and I say tied with love, but always having to be here to deal with customers. And, and that was great but it's also nice to not have to be here all the time. Uh, so, so it's how been does, a great success. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious, how does, how does the system work? Do you just go in? Do we get to see you on the other end? How does it work? Um, basically, it's a self-serve shack. Like we have a money drop box uh, and all the prices are listed. It mostly works on the honor system. And uh, we have people that will honk their horn if they have questions or if we're low on stuff. And for the most part for us, we stock the fridge three, four, five times a day uh, when it's convenient for us and, and we go.
Have you noticed uh, anything, you know, with consumer behavior um, now that, you know, we are still in a, in a pandemic? Have you seen an uptick in um, the number of calls about, you know, what you have available uh, for sale? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, there's been, people are buying local. There is a support local, there's a buy local, um, again, movement or awakening, which is great. I think local businesses, small businesses have been really impacted by COVID-19. And I think it's good that, that the, the people around you are supporting you and, and seeing what you're doing and, and seeing value there. Have you partnered up with any local businesses uh, to kind of, kind of give a, a diverse kind of array of, of, of crops and, and meats and, and, and stuff like that as well? Yeah, we did. So when um, the pandemic first started, we very quickly pivoted online. Uh, but we, for us, saw the value in teaming up with other local producers, specifically meat producers and other artisans that, you know, have great products, um, share the, the burden of delivery. And so we are now delivering online through our uh, online portal or, uh, order fresh and basically yeah it's been great it's the demand it's been wonderful the support has been great and it's nice to team up with other people and, and see uh, what you can bring it's not just about the greens right people want to eat a whole variety of other products too um, you know, this was something we talked about almost three years ago, and you had told me that you expect this to be uh, a big thing in Northern Ontario. Um, how far do you see this going, um, not just for your business, uh, but vertical farming in Northern Ontario and beyond? Um, I think the technology is getting cheaper. We, there's quite a few of us out there that are now have been, I, I use the word, grinding it out but grinding it out for the, for the lack of a better word uh, for a while now. And we're seeing ways that we can really make it work. The cultivars that work for us, um, the amount of phone calls I'm getting from schools, um, from community leaders, from community business development officers that want to get into indoor farming. I think it's only going to, I think I was right three years ago and I think it's only going to get bigger. Stefan, I want to thank you so much for taking the time. That's Stefan Longtemps, farmer and co-owner of Truly Northern. Thanks again. Thank you. And that's it for tonight's Agenda in the Summer. I'm Jan Jaganathan. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at tvo.org. And Nam will see you again on Monday. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. Ontario hubs are made possible by the Barry and Lori Green Family Charitable Trust and Goldie Feldman. And by viewers like you. Thank you.